Good afternoon, everyone. This is Wendy Richards from Seaward Equipment. Uh, welcome to the Screen Selection Hydraulics and Screenings Handling webinar. Um, just a few housekeeping items before we begin. During the presentation, there will be five multiple choice questions to answer by poll vote, and you will click on the answer that you think is correct. We'll post the results for all to see, and then we'll move on to the next slide. In addition, please feel free to type in your own questions anytime in the questions drop down arrow that you see on your dashboard, and we'll do our best to answer them at the end of the presentation as time allows. Um, this is important. To receive your PE credit for this webinar, you must complete the survey evaluation that will show up at the end. So please stay connected until you complete the evaluation. You'll also need to download the certificate of completion, which is an attachment under handouts on the drop down menu. Um, in addition to the certificate of completion, there's a PDF of this presentation. And if you miss downloading these, please contact Sherry and she'll attach them to the follow up email that she sends you. As a reminder, Andrew from Vulcan has given this presentation in the last couple of years to some of you. So it's up to you to keep a log and not count this PE credit twice. So that pretty much wraps up the announcements. With that, I'd like to introduce Andrew Sinhorst as our presenter. Andrew is the regional sales manager uh, with Vulcan Industries. He's a professional engineer. And with that, Andrew, please take it away. Thank you, Wendy. Appreciate everyone's attendance today. Uh, certainly with uh, the way that the uncertain times are going right now, these presentations hopefully can add some value to your day. I have attempted to include a varying range of topics on screening and screenings handling that are pertinent uh, both to operations staff as well as engineering staff when your next design process occurs. So with that, I would like to get started. Just a brief uh, slide here on, on Vulcan Industries and then moving on to the, the generic content. Um, Vulcan was founded in 1975 and, and just a few bullet points here on the company as a whole. Uh, predominantly though, what I wanna point out to each of you is the UL listing on the electrical shop. This is something that not just when it comes to screening and screenings handling equipment, but waste water and wastewater equipment on the broad broad scope, scope is this is something that differentiates us. Uh, many companies use outside uh, electrical panel building shops. We keep this in house because we feel that there's advantages on the design side as well as the operations side. Some topics that we'll be covering today uh, bulletized here are uh, why we, why do we remove screenings or why do we promote the removal of screenings rather than the grinding of screenings? Some different types of screens, screening design, screenings handling, uh, looking at screenings quantity in terms of trying to volumetrically calculate screenings volume, and then as well as how do we how do we move or convey those screenings? Many of these first few slides are, are a bit of comic relief before we get into the real content of it, but I think it's quite clear the benefits of screening. One common discussion that we get into is, is whether to grind or to screen. And, and in many cases, you know, certainly we're a screening manufacturer, so you can tell which side of that argument we would be on. But our argument is, and the basis of our argument is that by grinding screenings rather than removing them, at some point in time, they will Recoagulate or, or reweave uh, to the point where they become problematic, such as what's pictured in many of these and, and pumps specifically here being pictured, but downstream processes outside of pumps as well, losing efficiency in, in aeration equipment, downstream basins, and ultimately um, detrimental effect to the effluent quality, whether it be something that actually does show up in, in your daily or, or quarterly testing or something that's just a visual eyesore like what's pictured here. To try and give a, a broad brush overview of different screening technologies, we're going to focus on three different categories or types. Uh, mechanical bar screening, filter type screens, which is, is a pretty generic term that can include a lot of different types of screening technologies, and then perforated plate screens. When we look at mechanical bar screens, some categorizations that, that we at Vulcan use are, are the terms positive engagement and non-positive engagement. And, and the mechanics of that I'll, I'll dig into here in a second. 
When we look at filter type screens, we'll talk about stair screens and continuous belt screens. Continuous belt screens could be um, things like uh, Parks and AquaGuard or some of those other technologies where it's a, a rotating continuous belt. And then lastly, when we talk about perforated plate screens, there's a lot of different ways that perforated plate can be used in screening technologies, but a picture there kind of giving you a, um, an understanding of, of the category, generally speaking, what we'll touch on. Leading first into mechanical bar screens and the two different categorizations that we use. When we say positive engagement, what we're referring to is a mechanical component within the bottom of the screen that is forcing the rake heads into the bar rack, not allowing disengagement to occur. When we say non-positive engagement, what we're talking about is the reliance on gravity or some type of spring-loaded action that allows the rake heads to pull away from the bar rack. And, and that can be advantageous or disadvantage or a disadvantage and, and we'll look at some pictures that clearly show that but when we look at specifically multiple rake screens as what's pictured in both of these two the top one being the positive engagement so there's that forcible action at the bottom of the screen pressing the rake heads into the bar rack or secondly then the picture on the bottom and and a little bit of a, a physics 101 picture there that that we'll touch on in a, in a latter slide but the, the free body diagram there showing that the forces of gravity and, and what's necessary to keep those rake heads pushed into the bar rack with that design. The first type of positive engagement screen that I want to touch on here is a, a technology that's been around quite a while. Um, for Vulcan, it is still about 20% of our business or so, um, but that's looking at a climber or a reciprocating rake type screen. So these are um, a single rake arm design, no, the, the advantage of them being no moving parts below the water surface. So the rake head returning to the above the channel for op, for um, service and maintenance after, after a cleaning stroke. Looking at it a, a bit in a step-by-step -step here, first looking at the, the first um, pictorial on the far left there alluding to the, the rake head being at its parked position or at the top where maintenance can occur when the screen is called to run, whether it be differential or floats or timer, um, that screen rake arm, single rake arm travels to the bottom of the screen by way of a drive shaft with a cog wheel on either end walking up and down a pin rack. We'll, some pictures here, I'll show that more clearly in a second. R removing that material then discharging it, parking and waiting again then until it's called to run. Generally speaking, we see this type of screen applied in larger applications or where there's varying sizes of debris. The reason for the, the comment that varying sizes of debris are necessary is that the single rake arm is articulating in its fashion, meaning each side can, can move or pivot independently. That independence allows for the screen to be able to remove the debris, whether it be a tire, a wipe, um, or, or some debris we're going to look at in a second here, but some allowing you to be able to remove varying sizes of debris is what lends this screen well to applications like a raw water intake at a water plant where you might get rocks and sticks and, and larger debris or potentially um, like a packing house or a prison application where specifically at prisons we see debris that can range from an entire bed sheet to um, just simple typical domestic wastewater type debris. As we look at the, the rake arm design, it lends itself to being able to remove the, the picture in the upper right there being from a, a raw water plant. So it's the debris that you would ordinarily see in, in open surface water type um, plants. Also heavy grit removal. So applications like the the one pictured on the left there where it's a full full rake arm full of nothing but but grit and and fines and silty material that would could potentially be problematic for other technologies looking secondly then when we classify the the positive engagement comment there the the second type of positive engagement screen would be a, a multiple rake screen or oftentimes what i hear referred to as a traditional multiple rake screen meaning there's a fixed point at the bottom of the screen. The chain is passing around that fixed point. The rake heads themselves are forced into the bar rack. Vulcan started building the screen initially for the function of an improved or increased uh, um, removal efficiency of the screen. So looking at cubic feet per hour as a, as a metric there, 
to determine what volume of screenings can be removed by the screen. The multiple rakes lend themselves to a higher removal volume than, than say the first screen we looked at. When we talk about positive engagement and we allude to the advantages specifically to this design, one is that as the rake heads are turning around at the bottom of the screen, there is no, un, there isn't any uncertainty whether or not those teeth are fully penetrating the bars, removing any material that could be stuck in the full depth of the bar. Secondly, is that it is a competition between the horsepower of the motor and that rake head and whatever is stuck between. So if it's a piece of grit or um, a, a stick or something that's stuck between the teeth, um, stuck between the bars, it is motor of the horsepower versus whatever that piece of material is that's stuck. That same function, though, with the competition between the motor and, and a piece of grit, say, um, lends itself to a importance on structural integrity of the machine. So as we look at, um, we use the term unequally loaded debris, but what I mean by that is if, if all the material or whatever is stuck on the bar rack is all the way towards one side of the frame, all the way to the left or to the right of the screen, that places an unequal force on the chains that are tucked within either side of the frame. So that unequal force tends to want to spin the machine in a circle. So it's the structural integrity of the frame itself that maintains rotating, rotating assemblies, bearings, all those components that rely on the alignment of the overall screen. The frame, thickness of the stainless steel on the frame and the depth of the frame when I say depth of frame, I mean from upstream to downstream dimension, that those are the components within that frame that, that lend itself to a long lasting screen, uh, able to combat forced and lodged debris within the bar rack. When we look at a multiple rake screen, a couple discussion points come up and one of them being how fast to run the machine in, in terms of like feet per minute is, is to what speed do you run the rake heads? Certainly, the end goal is being able to remove all the screenings that are experienced by the machine in, in say, a first flush or your high, high screenings load applications. But there's a couple components that come together to equal that cubic feet per hour removal. One of them is certainly rake head speed. But additionally to that, we would promote that things like rake head volume and rake head spacing also have something to do with that calculation and that the more material you can fit on each individual rake head, the slower you can run it and achieve the same removal capacity. That bucket-like shape that you see in the lower right-hand picture there is looking down on a rake head and, and specifically what I wanna point out too is the, the back plate and the side plates that exist on that rake head that are allowing you to capture that material, hold a volume, a larger volume metric uh, in terms of cubic feet per linear feet of rake width. So it's allowing you to hold more material per rake head, thus allowing you to slow the, the machine down and lessen the wear and tear on all the rotating assemblies. Additionally, that bucket allows you to, uh, or gets you out of some of this general appearance of a screen. And this is, um, I talk a little bit bad about this screen and, and in a second we're going to talk good about it because this is the technology um, that we're going to talk about here in a second but two things are a disadvantage to to what you see in the picture here one of them is that the the links themselves are in the flow path and secondly is that the uh, rake heads themselves are more flat in nature and, and so the the screenings are allowed to in some cases slough off the screen depending on other other design constraints uh, within this machine. When we look at a multiple rake screen with a positive engagement means at the bottom, the disadvantage that often comes up is that what happens if something is truly stuck in the bar rack? Does the do the rakes jam and then what occurs? Uh, to that argument, one is it's protected with the VFD and controls. So when the screen jams it attempts to run in reverse and push that material out from both forward and backward direction but secondly to that is Vulcan goes above and beyond to 
uh, align the the bars or bend the bars, fabricate the bars so such that they mimic the travel of the rake head. And the advantage to that is that the screen is most susceptible to jamming at the point where the rake head engages the bar rack. So if there's a pile of grid at the bottom, as that rake head comes around, the teeth want to push or jam all that material through the bars. By curving the bar rack like this, what we're trying to do is allow the velocity of the water to, our, to work to our advantage, meaning material that sits on top of those bars is pushed towards the back of the bar rack with the velocity of the water, water going away from you in both of these pictures. The velocity of that water pushes the material towards the back of the bar rack. So as the rake heads come around, they engage the bars in the horizontal section rather than the vertical section, thus reducing the impact that the grit will have as that rake head comes around. When we talk about the positive engagement and that design component that's underneath the water surface, there's a couple, there's a couple different design characteristics that that exist within the marketplace and, and the picture on the left there being the, the rotating sprocket assembly where where we started as a um, manufacturer with this type of screen but certainly for obvious reasons getting away from a rotating assembly when beneath the water was was something of importance to us the picture on the right there being a static guide so nothing is rotating or turning within that assembly that black cover that you see there is just protecting what's behind that component there it's a stainless steel hub with a synthetic surface heat shrunk on the hub. And, and a couple things to consider here. One is nothing is rotating or turning. So that's a certain advantage to this, this design. Secondly, though, is that the assembly that's behind that black plate is a 360 degree or, or a, a, a circular hub. At the 10 year point with either of these two designs, an operator would get in the channel, assess the condition of either one of them. The one on the left, the, the rotating sprocket, there is a, a sleeve that can be, be replaced with the version on the right. An operator would remove six bolts and rotate that stainless steel hub 180 degrees because currently, or for the first 10 years of its life, only the bottom 180 is, has any exposure to the chain. The top 180 is a, a raw surface then such that it, 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 in total, it's a 20 year assembly. So getting away from the term positive engagement now looking at the alternative the um, original conception for this type of screen was looking at the catenary screens that have existed since the 60s um, and going to a design that combines that cat catenary like approach with the traditional multiple rake screen like we just previously looked at the advantages to a link style screen and, and vulcan uses the term vkr to describe this type of screen of vulcan knuckle rake so whether you want to use the term knuckle rake or link style screen um, the advantages to this are its simplicity so as we look at uh, operator maintenance there's no mechanical maintenance that's required below the water surface you've gotten away from that sprocket or that static guide we'll talk about the disadvantages that come along with that but you've you've gone away from anything like that below the water surface requiring uh, mechanical maintenance. I said we'd rehash our physics uh, from college here a little bit, and, and this is where this comes up, is that when you, in order to understand the disadvantages of this type of screen, it's important to, to take a little step back here and, and boil it down in its most simplistic form. And as we look at the free body diagram here, the weight of those links and the weight of those rake heads is what's applying that force against the bar rack. So it, the importance that, that Vulcan places is, is in the weight of the links. And, and that's something that, that we feel like is, is an inherent advantage to the design that we've put together is that the weight of the links drive that force against the bar rack. The more you keep the rake heads against the bar rack, the less you're gonna have issues with blinding and fat soils and greases on the back side of the bar rack and in some of the um, general blinding conditions that can occur if those rake heads are allowed to disengage routinely. That said, the dis disengagement does have its advantage and, and that is that if there is material larger than a rake head, such as the tire pictured here, the rake heads can essentially pin it against the bar rack and remove that debris all the way to the top 
without having jams and things like that occur, like what would happen with the multiple rake screen we looked at just a second ago. So this is the advantage. The disadvantage that does occur is while that debris is being removed all the way to the top of the screen, the rake heads remain away from the bar rack. So blinding does occur on the bar rack until this material can get removed all the way to the top. So depending on the length of the screen, that can be an impactful consideration. The disadvantages of this screen are largely seen in the two pictures here. So the, the picture on the left looking in the direction of flow, the picture on the right looking at the back side of the bar rack. What has occurred here is, is symptomatic of, of the disadvantage of the screen. And that is that as material is allowed to build on the back side of the bar rack, or say a piece of grit is stuck between the, the bars, is that over time, those rake heads continue disengaging slightly more and more and more until that type of material is built up. So what we often talk about is that, no, this screen doesn't have any mechanical maintenance to be performed beneath the water surface. However, there is housekeeping type maintenance that is necessary, whether that be the picture on the right there where you've got the fats, oils, and greases that have accumulated to that mass of material that has to be sprayed off, or the picture that we saw previously with the rags and the wipes on the screen. Um, those are two things that can be a misconception with this type of screen is that you do get away from mechanical maintenance, but you've picked up housekeeping maintenance that wouldn't have otherwise existed with other multiple rake technologies. Additionally, the first bullet point here alluding to the, the horsepower of the motor doing the work for you. And, and we talked with the, the first multiple rake screen about how the horsepower of the motor was in direct competition with the grit or whatever is stuck in the bars differently than this type of screen, which is if a piece of grid is stuck in the bar rack, the motor is still only competing against the, the weight of the links, the weight of the rake heads and whatever material is already on those rake heads. It's not motor versus piece of grit. It's just motor versus weight or motor versus gravity. So for that reason, you often see, you see quite a difference between the, the frame construction of this screen versus the first multiple rake screen. And, and again, it's that, is the motor competing against the frame or is the motor competing only against gravity? That's what drives that difference in design there. And with that, I'll turn it over to Wendy for a polling question break. Okay, um, our very first question I'm putting before you, when evaluating multiple screens, what is the differentiator between types? Please select one, teeth size, rake engagement, number of bars, material removed. I'll give you a few minutes to answer. It seems like most people have answered. Give you another couple of seconds. Got about 80% of you have voted so far. Okay. Oops. So I'm going to share the answer. The answer is rake engagement. And the majority of you did pick that. I think 70% of you. So that's the correct answer. I think we can go back to the presentation now. The slightly confusing part there about the or the the trick that was thrown in there with material removed is is the question was alluding to multiple rake screens specifically and what differentiates the two multiple rake screens. Certainly material removed is a differentiator between a multiple rake screen and the climber type screen we looked at first, but that was the trick that was thrown in that that answer there. Okay, moving along to filter type screens and, and the advantage with, a, with any filter type screen, this technology as well as the next one we're gonna look at, same, same principle applies here is that 
there is an increased capture that's allowed or that is achievable with a filter type screen. When we say filter screen or that, that general classification, what we're alluding to is the, the opportunity to use compounding capture. When we talk about a filter screen, we're using the screening material in the wastewater to create an increased capture. So that rag or that wipe sticks to the screening surface. That rag or that wipe then capture grit and hair and finer particulate. So whereas the quarter inch spacing of the screen or whatever the, the number is, we'll use quarter inch for an example. Although the spacing on the screen might be quarter inch, that rag or that wipe that's that's stuck to that screening surface has allowed you to use some compounding capture to remove more material by way of creating a filter. When Andrew, we look at a couple, oh, Andrew, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. I actually was going to do the second question, um, and I forgot to do that. So let's do the second question or poll question next before we move on. Sounds good. The question is, what physics principle does a link style or catenary screen rely on? Stokes law, Hooke's law, gravity, or momentum? So go ahead and vote. I promise this one's not as confusing as the first one. Now we've got some pretty quick answers on this one. <laughs> Looks like about a little over 80% of you have voted. Give you a couple more seconds. All right, we'll take a look. The answer is gravity. I would say 81% of you did select gravity. So that's the right answer. And I guess with that, we'll continue on. So as we look at filter type screens, generically, I want to look at two two different types: a continuous belt, which can encompass a couple different uh, screening surface types, whether it be a finger finger type, which I alluded to earlier when we talked about the AquaGuard or the Parks and AquaGuard type, could be a perforated plate. There are numerous types of continuous belt, but what I mean, generally speaking, by that continuous belt comment is that the water is passing through both the upstream and downstream screening surface. So as that continuous belt is rotating in a circle, water essentially goes through it twice. And the important design component here to consider is that the consideration is often that we, the head loss is then multiplied by two because it's going through both the front and the back screening surface. However, what occurs between the two screening surfaces is an increased velocity, and thus the second screening surface has considerably higher head loss. So as we get in, as as you consider these projects and and look at alternative uh, design approaches for continuous belt, note that the head loss is is a bit more than than two times. Um, in terms of trying to achieve a filter type screening surface without the use of a continuous belt to, to potentially reduce head loss in a, uh, say a retrofit application or somewhere with higher, tighter constraints is to look at potentially using a stair screen. So a stair screen is a uh, escalator like design where the material is allowed to build on the screening, screening face, like we talked about to achieve that filter action. That material is built up on those stairs as head loss increases, those stairs take one push that screening surface or take that filter that's built up on the front and push it up one step. So routinely uh, or every time the screen is called to run, it maybe moves the material up one or two steps, allowing for an open area on the bottom. Giving you here this uh, in a step-by-step -step approach here, one being a, the first step being where that you've, you've allowed that mat of material to build a high head loss. Number two and three being as we've moved that material up in, in picture three, you're really starting to see that open area at the bottom. So this is, again, using that filtering surface on the front, that filtering surface looking 
like this. And these are both stair screen pictures, but that filter of material like you see here would be synonymous with other technologies as well is that that is really showing what's achieving that that filter like surface. The more material you build on the front, the higher your capture will be. And in turn, the more efficient your screen will be. As we look specifically at stair screens here and, and uh, just full dis disclosure for, for all of you is that Vulcan only makes a stair screen. Vulcan does not make a continuous belt. So certainly this is um, a bit more of where my expertise lies as opposed to other, other filter type technologies. But when we look at stair screen applications specifically, usually we're looking at something that is of a pumped flow. So not overly deep and in those applications the the reason we talk about pump flow is that we know with a stair screen you cannot remove any debris that can't sit on one of those steps that you see in the picture so about three inches is the depth of those stairs so if the material is larger than that three inches it will tend to roll in the water and not be removed so for that reason a stair screen is it's not a core screen it's not utilized in um, say a septage receiving station, they're just they're not well suited for those applications. But the advantage of a stair screen is the there's no, they don't require brushes or wash water. And certainly as we look at fine screening, brushes and wash water are a unintended, unintended consequence of, of those fine screening technologies. With a uh, perforated plate type screen, many of these these comments echo many of those that I just stated. But as we look at more specifically perforated plate type technologies here is that the capture can certainly increase greatly over some of the other technologies we've talked about. The head loss typically follows the, the higher the capture, the smaller the opening, the greater the head loss. Certainly that's, that's a linear uh, function there. When we look at removal of that material is as you as you accumulate that filter or that material on those perforations is, is how do you get it off and picture in the lower right there being an example of a, of a brush but certainly um, an added added maintenance item that can come with uh, finer finer screening and picture on the left there um, water flows in one side and out both sides of the screening surface so there are certainly technologies out there that can allow you to achieve that higher capture while not taking a significant hit on head loss. As we get away from screen types and specifically now, and, and I wanna start looking a bit more at hydraulics and channel design and, and some tips of the trade here, tips of the, um, I guess often, fallacies here a little bit, but but many of these things are um, screening design discussions that we like to have routinely, rather than just saying, hey, here's your screen, let's drop it in the channel. So uh, there's a lot of these considerations that that we often uh, like to engage in early on in a design. And, and really what we're looking at is, is a four steps of the screening process is one, can you hydraulically pass the flow? And that one being, these these are in order of importance, but hydraulically passing the flow being of utmost importance in that, are you gonna select a screening technology that is potentially gonna cause problems in a peak flow event? Two being, let's achieve a, a hydraulic condition in a peak flow that allows all that water to pass, doesn't overtop the channel, while still removing as much material as possible. Once we've removed that material, how do we get it to the discharge point, whether that be uh, a deep um, facility that requires the screen to be longer, getting it up to the top. And then secondly, once you've gotten those screenings to their floor of discharges, is how do you get them to the receiving bin and what do you do in between? Do you just convey it? Do you clean it and convey it? And that fourth point is, is where we're going to spend uh, a bit of time here in a second is once those screenings have been removed, what's the organic content? What's the importance of removing the visible fecal material or the other organics that, that can exist? What's what's the importance of that BOD and that carbon content for downstream processes? 
channel geometry is often something that it, specifically in new construction we certainly have some control over most retrofit applications or, or a lot of retrofit applications we see this uh, often and that is attempting to channel geometry is a function of attempting to evenly load the screen so we want that screening surface both both these two pictures uh, specifically are stair screens but we want that screening surface to be evenly the material to be evenly divided across the full width of the channel when we see bends and curves in the channel upstream of the screen you can often end up with a velocity distribution that doesn't evenly distribute those screenings on the screening on the on the screen surface itself a couple pictures here that are pretty extreme type cases but the one on the left there you can certainly see that it almost looks like you're looking at a at a large river uh, with a sandbar off to the side but this type of uh, instance can occur often in in cases where we have a compact headworks where that you didn't allow um, some straight run of of section to evenly redistribute those screenings prior to hitting the screen and secondly in terms of channel design we want to look at velocities and, and velocity is the constant battle as we look at screen screening design is a battle between two different velocities it's it's velocity in the channel and velocity through the bars when we look at channel velocity we want to ensure that we're not promoting a, a stagnant water or too slow of a water upstream of the screen to result in what you see in the picture there which is a bunch of grit that's deposited upstream of the screen but secondly to that is we don't want to allow the velocity through the bars to get too high so it's a battle between having too low channel velocity with too high a bar velocity and when we specifically dig into those two numbers what we're targeting is a velocity through the bars of no more than four feet per second and a velocity in the channel of no less than 1.25 feet per second and, and certainly as we look at high peaking factors or combined systems these aren't always achievable and, and for the most part it's a discussion with operators in a balance of what's more important uh, in that four feet per second through the bars is certainly ideal however in that two percent of peak occurrences where we see that peak flow is the screenings volume going to be higher than than your average day those are these are questions that we would ordinarily ask to arrive at what is the optimum velocities for those two conditions to achieve the least amount of maintenance on both the screen and the channel itself the recommendations of this WEF publication shown on the right here the manual of practice is, is commonly referred to when we look at headworks and screening design and, and so certainly Vulcan has a uh, our own um, design constraints that we like to see based on our experience but for the sake of the the presentation and, and Vulcan largely in most applications is, is also referencing this WEF publication here and and it's uh, consideration of those velocities that we previously talked about looking at your freeboard in a blinded condition blinded condition percentage varies per screening technology as we look at a climber type screen we want to talk about a more blinded screen because certainly we only have one rake head and it's going to take longer to get from the the lower bar rack up to the discharge point and make that same cycle again that is a different blinded percentage that we want to evaluate for freeboard versus say a multiple rake screen that's going to clean the bar rack more frequently um, when we uh, look at high peaking factors like we talked about on the previous slide one common um, discussion that's had is how can we vary the downstream water level while oh, vary the downstream water level across the full flow regime meaning all the way down from your 1 a.m or 2 a.m flow all the way to your peak condition how do we how do we vary the downstream water level to be an ideal target thus making the velocities in the channel and the velocity through the bars optimum we talk about things like channel profiling or channel fillets where we're pouring um, triangular shaped uh, fillets with concrete grout something like that against the walls so that the velocity at the bottom of the channel is higher than the velocity as the as the water level comes up um, 
the use of a downstream weir that's potentially going to force uh, a backwater or a higher water level uh, on the screen. Some of those different uh, technologies or um, different design approaches could can be considered in those high peaking factor conditions. Spending just a, a few slides here on, on open channel hydraulic calculation types and, and not to get into the weeds too far, because certainly this is uh, when, we're, when we're giving a remote presentation like this, especially with a, as large of an audience as this is, is that um, certainly this doesn't apply or interest all of you. So I'll keep this section rather short. But anytime we're evaluating a, a screening application, whether it be a retrofit or a new application, we're varying the downstream water level to achieve those optimum velocities like we previously talked. So screening hydraulics are always calculated working in an upstream or a, a, a direction of knowing the downstream water level working back through the head loss to achieve your upstream water level. That downstream water level is what's achieving or what's guiding your velocity through the bars as well as in the channel. When we do that, there's two ways two methods that are used to calculate head loss through a screen. And these are, again, these are these are WEF, um, or WEF MOP8 recommendations. These aren't necessarily Vulcan specific by any means. These are, these are hydraulic calculations from as far back as the 1700s. So these are um, considerations to be made and, and we'll dive into each of these here just a little bit. Bernoulli's equation, which like I said is it's been around far longer than the other. Bernoulli's equation makes some assumptions and doesn't utilize the parameters listed there at the bottom. It doesn't care what the screen angle is and the bar shape. And those are two uh, really important factors as we look at um, head loss across the screen. And so as we consider Bernoulli's equation, we talk about it as being the conservative approach. Bernoulli's is far more conservative in its value that will that it will result in for a head loss than the other technology the other method we're going to talk about and that's Kirschmer's method Kirschmer's method is an empirically based lab tested formula that does take into account all those things that i said that the previous equation doesn't but what is important here to take away from between this equation and the other is that bernoulli's equation is always conservative Kirschmer's, Kirschmer's equation is most commonly more reflective of what you will see in the field with the exception of high velocity scenarios. Kirschmer's method being empirically based, like I mentioned, was tested truly only on uh, realistic velocities given WEF MOP8. And, the, and, and WEF MOP8 recommends those that four feet per second through the bars. As you exceed four feet per second through the bars, you start to have some unusual hydraulic conditions that are occurring there, uh, turbulence and things like that, that, that lead to a higher head loss than what Kirschmer's will reflect. So our recommendation is always to evaluate both methods of calculating to use Bernoulli's equation in consideration of freeboard while using Kirschmer's method more so in terms of developing your hydraulic profile and looking at what is the actual water level going to be realistic in the field? And to further expound on that, the consideration of both, like I just talked, but secondly is don't overemphasize manufacturer claims. And what I'm alluding to there is that if the channel dimensions are given, the bar dimensions are, the bar spacing is given, the bar dimensions are given, all those things are parameters within a specification every this is specifically alluding to bar screen manufacturers now every bar screen should have the exact same head loss because nobody bars nobody spacings the channel width is the same every manufacturer should result in the same head loss however what you'll often see is a reported head loss on a on a screen that is does not indicate calculation type so whether it be Kirschmer's or Bernoulli's so oftentimes you a manufacturer will say the head loss is x feet and with no indication of how it was how it was derived, um, so that's one emphasis I would I would place on on head loss calcs from manufacturers is to be inquisitive about how did they get there and 
to what level of conservatism have they already applied to those head loss calcs. If they're giving you Bernoulli's, this is a, now getting towards the last bullet here, is in terms of being comfortable with freeboard is that Bernoulli's, you know Bernoulli's is already conservative. So you have some comfort level for what the calculated freeboard should be. If you're provided a head loss from a screening manufacturer and you don't know whether it's Bernoulli's or Kirschmer's, you've, you're not certain as to where the, the conservatism needs to lie there. As we talk about capture and quantity of capture, certainly as a bar screen manufacturer, we at Vulcan are, are a bit skittish on this. And, and partly that's because it's certainly true that a bar screen is not going to capture the same amount of material as a fine screen or a perforated plate or a band screen or some of these other technologies we've talked about. When we look at a bar screen versus a filter type screen, so that stair screen bullet there, you can see the, the 20 cubic feet per MGD going up to 25 cubic feet per MGD, and that's that function of that compounding capture that's achieved. Um, and then lastly there, the, the band screen and perforated plate screens, when we talk about capture in terms of a percentage, can be variable depending on manufacturer and, and technology used. But generally speaking, when we talk about capture in terms of a percentage, our uncertainty always lies in percentage of what? what percentage of capture of what size of material at what velocity. We talked about all those things previously that are important as we look at hydraulics. They also have a large say in capture. So if you run the stair screen without the filter on the front, certainly your percentage of capture is gonna be way lower. So that the pictures there at the bottom just generically describing, are we talking about capturing the rag on the left or are we talking about capturing the shredded material on the right? And in summary, to before we totally change gears here on this, that the consideration that, that we always discuss when we're talking about what volume of material do we want to remove is the smaller the, generally speaking, the smaller the openings, whether it be bar, slots, or holes, the smaller the openings, certainly the more you capture, but the more maintenance that's going to go along with that. The more you, the more you remove, the more you maintain. And with that, we'll take our last uh, polling break from Wendy. Yes, um, hold on. <laughs> We're gonna do two more questions here quickly in our last 10 minutes or so. Um, question number three, which of the two models for hydraulic head loss is more conservative, Bernoulli's or Kirschmer's? We've got some pretty quick votes happening. Almost 90% of you have voted, so we'll go ahead and look at what your results were. 87% picked the Bernoulli's, that's the correct answer. Um, we'll move on to the next question real quick. Hold on. Number four, will a stair screen remove the same, more, or less material than a bar screen with the same bar rack opening or spacing size? The same, more, or less? I think we've got the majority of people voted. We'll give it another second or two. All right, we'll close and we'll share the results. The answer is more. And the majority of you did pick that, 63%. So that's good. And with that, Andrew, you can continue. We'll do the last question at the end. And we'll wrap up here with screenings conveyance and screenings treatment. And what we're talking about that is uh, certainly the screenings have to get from the screen that removes them to wherever they're to be disposed. And, and a couple different technologies here, uh, belt conveyor, screw conveyor, the one on the far right is a sluice trough, which is probably the most um, uncommon of the, of the three here, but 
sluice trough describing a U-shaped trough that uses water to convey the screenings. Uh, what you see pictured there is a similar uh, example of that, but as the screenings are dropped, the water is then sloped downhill to convey those screenings. And lastly is the use of a washing press or a screw press. And that's where we're gonna spend a bit of our time here is that we talk about the use of a washing press because it can oftentimes negate the, the or remove the necessity for other conveyance means. Once the screenings have been washed, dewatered, and compacted, they can be pressed through piping um, up to a distance of about 25 feet normally uh, comfortably. And secondly to that is, is also you're getting some conveyance while achieving a couple other unintended um, functions here. And one of them is a reduction in screenings volume by 75% is, is kind of the industry standard accepted number there in a organic washing of 90%. Earlier, we talked about the finer the screenings, the more organics you're gonna capture with those screenings. And so, and oftentimes we're talking about being able to wash those screenings off so that you can more easily dispose of them or potentially need the, bi the biology then for downstream processes. And to give a brief example here visually is to look at a 10 MGD example with quarter inch bar spacing. On a peak, peak day, uh, or sorry, a peak hour, you will achieve about 9.4 cubic yards of screenings. And that's, again, this is like a first flush instance here. Um, but with the use of a washing press, rather than 9.4 cubic yards per hour, you achieve 2.3 cubic yards per hour. So potentially, in some cases, the volume of material and being able to change out dumpsters and things like that in a first flush instance, potentially that's a driver for this machine as well. And, and really to sum it up in, in one picture here, the washing press, or two pictures, sorry, the washing press is, is achieving a material that you, or accepting a material like you see on the picture on the left there, and the byproduct then looking like the picture on the right. Looking at washing presses, generally speaking here, a couple uh, points to, do, to bring up are that a washing press is, is often more uh, rich, put through more rigorous operation than, than the screen itself. And so maintenance items on a washing press should be largely considered with a project just as well as the screen. And, and a couple things that um, are maybe things to keep your eye on is maintenance that's required within the machine itself. And what I mean by that is many units utilize wear bars in the machine. And that is because the screw itself is riding on those bars at the bottom as that screw is turning, it's, it's wearing on sacrificial pieces of stainless steel. Different than that, Vulcan utilizes an axial thrust bearing or a fitting that goes between the gearbox and the body of the machine that's lifting that screw up or cantilevering that screw. So the picture on the right there is not wear bars that you see at the bottom. Those are rifling bars that are preventing the material from spinning in a circle. So rather than spinning in a circle as that screw turns, it's pushing the material out. Secondly is that a washing press uses water to wash off the organics. So that water that is used to clean off the organics has to leave or rid the machine. So whether it be wedge wire like you see here that, that Vulcan utilizes or perforated plate, those are the two different types that you'll see in the bottom of the machine. So this is in the the drain section or just below the screw. The picture on the left there would be looking down into the machine as if you were the screenings falling into it. So that wedge wire is selected in, in our case because uh, for one, the ability to, to strengthen and reinforce wedge wire differs than perf plate. And secondly is as that brush is rotating, those linear slots provide more of a cutting surface than the um, perforated plate type version. A washing press is a batch mode operation machine utilizing a PLC to clean those screenings. And the way the screenings are cleaned, at least in Vulcan's case, is, is the use of agitation. So the screw is running in both a forward and reverse direction. <clears throat> when it's running in a forward direction, it's compacting the material down into the washing and dewatering zones. <clears throat> the screen is the screw is stopping then and running in reverse. And when it runs in reverse, it, it pulls those screenings apart, agitates them, while then water is, is washed on those screenings. The, the most important of them being number one that's indicated there, washing those screenings from the inside out as well as the outside in. Quick little video here. In combined systems, the use of a washing press is, is prevalent. However, a consideration that needs to be made is 
is it possible that you could get this type of debris here? And this is certainly a bit of a, a joke here, but is it possible that you could get debris other than rags and wipes? Is is a, a brick, a two by four, that kind of debris possible at a at a CSO type station? Most commonly we see absolutely it is possible. In summary here, with a washing press, the two uh, metrics that we go by are a reduction in volume by 75% and 95% of the organics washed back into the flow stream while also being able to convey the screenings a distance uh, if necessary. So in conclusion, three points to take away from this. One is consider your channel hydraulics. We talked about for a whole litany of reasons why that's the case, but don't just select the screen, also select the channel hydraulics. Secondly is consider and reconsider your screen. Is maintenance more important than capture or is capture more important than maintenance? And that's kind of the evaluation to be made there. And lastly, don't ignore what happens after the screen. Don't let the screenings handling component be the and then component. Let the screenings handling or your washing press or conveyor also drive the project just as much as the screen itself. So with that, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I think Wendy has one more question, but I appreciate all of your attendance. Yes, uh, thanks, Andrew. I will launch this next question. What maintenance function on a washing press is most cumbersome but can be overcome? The screw wear, the wear bar replacement, greasing bearings, or visual observations? We got a little bit of typo on the greasing bearings, but. I'll give you another few seconds to complete the survey question. Looks like most of you have voted. So the answer is wear bar replacement and the majority of you did get that 63%, very good. Um, with that, if you do have additional questions, feel free to type them in the question drop-down menu, or you can email them to myself or Sherry. Also, I just wanted to remind you to please complete the survey or evaluation at the end before you disconnect um, so that that gets submitted automatically. And if you haven't already downloaded the certificate of completion or the PDF of this presentation, that's also a drop-down in the handout. There's two handouts noted. And Andrew, I thought you did a great job. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. We have a few questions. Did you want to go over those real quick? You bet. Uh, sure. Do you see those, Andrew? The one question I see says, I'm unable to download the certificate of completion. <laughs> Unless I'm missing a question. Nope. Um, up higher, I have, um, could you please share application examples for the types of filters? I see them now. Sorry about that. Typically for the filter type screens, uh, certainly capture is a driver. So potentially you're looking at say quarter inch spacing but you need more capture than or you would expect to achieve more capture than a mechanical bar screen so that's that's certainly a, a driver there when we look at a filter type screen versus say a perforated plate type screen um, i probably am not the most well suited to answer that as as certainly as i mentioned before we don't make a perforated plate type screen however um one common discussion point that comes up when we look at achieving that higher capture without the use of brushes and wipes is something or brushes and, and wash water is something like a stair screen could get you away from the, the brushes and wash water uh, while still achieving that same capture. Um, okay. 
what would the question is what would you recommend for a stormwater application that would be auto cleaning and capable of removing branches and rock that would overflow a stream bank um, we have a, uh, speaking specifically now towards Vulcan's applications here we uh, most commonly just just based on what you're describing there would evaluate the use of our climber type screen or the Vulcan mensch screen partly that is because when we see these stormwater applications there's a large uncertainty in what the size of the material may be and like we talked earlier that articulating rake arm on the climber type screen lends itself well to being able to remove those that larger debris that you may experience as well a climber type screen would be our industry wide as we look at the mechanical bar screen types would be our um, most robust willing to accept um, large debris and uh, high velocity type scenarios um, one question was posed here what do you use for wash water um, none of the screening technologies that vulcan manufacturers require wash water other than our uh, internally fed drum screen with our washing press as we talk about using water to wash off the organics the if i'm understanding your question correctly we would use either potable or non-potable source of water for wash water if it's non-potable we typically just use a little y strainer or something to ensure that the particulate size isn't overly large but on a washing press none of the orifices within the machine are um, are small or fan type orifices where they would cause plugging so that's not a concern with with our washing press and if i haven't interpreted your question there correctly feel free to follow up with another one um, i see a note here or a couple notes about the uh, certificate of completion unable to download that and if I'm not mistaken, Sherry will be sending out a certificate of completion following this as well by PDF. Is that correct, Sherry? Yes. So I did add another certificate on there if you want to try to download it now. Um, tomorrow you'll be getting a follow-up email at noon, and that will also have the certificate on there um, and just a few other things if you want to download. So if you did not get it today or um, unable to download it, you will get it tomorrow at noon. um okay i see a second part of a question i attempted to address just a second ago the, the first question was could you please share application examples for the types of filters and uh, then the second part of that question that showed up here has said that would be for positive engagement and non-positive engagement filters specifically and and um, i apologize if i didn't make this overly clear uh, initially but the positive engagement, non-positive engagement or classification terms used to describe multiple rake screens. Filter type screens are generally, or, or multiple rake screens are not generally considered to be filter type screens. Um, certainly we like to run a multiple rake screen um, where it doesn't start until it has achieved some differential. That differential level is an indication that there's material on the bar rack. That material does create some compounding effect in terms of it achieving a higher capture. However, we don't typically see a multiple rake screen, positive or non-positive engagement, included in terms of uh, being classified as a filter screen. So hopefully that clarification helps there. Uh, and it looks like the remainder of the questions are all uh, relating to the certificate of completion. So I appreciate all of your attendance um sherry i'm seeing just a couple more pop up here even since you made that comment um saying it still won't download so be patient you'll receive it by email would be my comment yes. there and, and uh, appreciate all of your attendance thank you for jumping on uh, best wishes to everybody through this crazy time and and hopefully you're being uh, you're able to be productive at home and can return to work soon Thanks, Andrew. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye.